Hi, my name is Renee Cartwright, president of Los Serenos de Point Vicente. Today, I'm here to introduce an exciting new program, the Junior Dosen Nature Series Peninsula Profile. The Junior Dosen produced this series in collaboration with the Rancho Palos Verdes Educational Channel, RPVTV, and RPVTV's high school interns. The segments that you're about to see cover aspects of the culture, history, and wildlife on the peninsula. The program is based on papers that the docents wrote. Los Serenos de Point Vincente is a volunteer organization which assists and supports the City of Rancho Palos Verdes objectives for the Point Vincente Interpretive Center, its parks and trails with regard to the natural and cultural history of the Palos Verdes Peninsula. At present, there are 150 members consisting of docents, volunteers, and junior docents. The junior docents are students from Peninsula and Palos Verdes High Schools who, after completing our training program, become docents. Our docents lead tours for over 40,000 visitors that come through the Interpretive Center each year. We also lead public hikes on the various trails in Rancho Palos Verdes. In addition to the Junior Dozen program, Los Arena co-sponsors many other events, including the annual Whale of a Day, a California Coastal Cleanup Day at Abalone Cove, an educational program for Title I elementary school children, and a sixth grade geology program for Peninsula students. For more information on Los Arenos, go to www.losarenos.org or look for us on Facebook.com. Now, here are the Junior Docents. Enjoy the program. Many people know the pelican to be a long-billed bird with a trademark throat pouch, but not many people are familiar with other characteristics of the brown pelican and how a pesticide nearly put them on the endangered species list. The brown pelican ranges up to four feet in length with a seven foot wingspan. The pelican has a grayish brown body as an adult. They are called the brown pelicans because they are completely brown when they are born. These birds are also characterized by a white head and a brown crown. Creating habitats along the west coast, the brown pelican is naturally a warm weathered species. California brown pelicans use a lift of air and thermals to aid in soaring. They are also very capable of flap gliding over the open sea in lines or V formations. When feeding, the pelican will circle around a school of fish and then dive down to scoop up the fish. Using their long bills, the pelican will take in large amounts of water and fish in their pouches of skin. This bill can hold two to three times the material in the stomach. The pelican can hold nearly three gallons of both fish and water. The only pelican that is a plunge diver is the California brown pelican. What that means is, pelicans will dive 10 to 65 feet and then skim the surface of the ocean for fish. They rely solely on the ocean as their main food source. Average diet of pelicans consists of anchovies, sardines, and mackerel. They build full-size nests on the ground or in shrubbery in close proximity to the coast and on islands for feeding purposes. During their breeding season, pelicans' necks turn a dark brown and their pouch turns a bright red. This breeding factor helps scientists determine what time they are breeding. Another known fact is that they lay an average of three eggs in their breeding season. While the adult male and female brown pelicans look the same, all baby pelicans are born entirely brown. Unfortunately, the brown pelican was at one point endangered due to excess emitting of harmful pesticide called DDT. DDT is a pesticide used on crops to kill mosquitoes and other pests. At the time that DDT was being used heavily, people were worried about getting malaria, and they did not believe the pesticide would have an effect on animals because humans weren't affected. The DDT started to affect pelicans first during their breeding season. Pelicans are exceptionally susceptible to a bioaccumulation of the pesticide DDT. This caused reproductive failure by altering calcium metabolism and thinning in eggshells. The shells surrounding the pelican embryo were weakened and broke easily. The reproductive rates 
fell nearly 50% during the first year that excess DDT was being dumped into the ocean. The brown pelican was listed as an endangered species in 1970. A famous book, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, claimed the attention on the public and raised awareness of what was happening to the pelicans. This helped the cause of banning DDT. During the 1970s, the use of DDT was officially banned, and there have been strict precautions and restrictions that control the use of pesticides in the U.S. Almost immediately, pelican reproduction rates rocketed, and they were taken off the endangered species list. A decade after DDT was banned, the pelicans are nearly at their usual rate of reproduction. Scientists do believe that the pelicans will thrive once more. Our Palos Verdes Peninsula was home to the first oceanarium on the west coast. Marine Land was open on August 28, 1954. Located just half a mile south of the Point Vicente Interpretive Center, Marine Land is considered California's first major theme park, opening one year before Disneyland. The most popular attraction at Marine Land was the trained pilot whale Bubbles and Orcas Orky and Corky. These beloved whales were the largest animals in any zoo or oceanarium across the world. The dolphin and sea lion shows were also a favorite among visitors. Sharks, birds, and harbor seals are just some of the other animals that called Marine Land home. People were also able to dress up in wetsuits and swim with fish and sharks in the Baja Reef. Through these activities and viewing windows, visitors could see the animals like never before. It was as if the tourists had been dropped in the wild. Besides education, Marine Land provided family entertainment. Much like Disneyland, characters such as Yogi Bear and Scooby-Doo walked the park. For 33 years, Marine Land became an integral part of our Palos Verdes Peninsula. However, Marine Land simply could not attract enough business. In 1978, Marine Land attempted to renovate the park with new attractions and a fresh new look. The new owners replaced old asphalt with grass, trees, flower beds, and red brick walkways. A marine animal care center was also built on the premises to treat stranded animals. Visitors also enjoyed the Sky Tower, a newly built 400-foot tall rotating elevator car with a panoramic view from Ventura to Orange County. However, even after being remodeled, Marine Land could not be saved. Today, the closing of Marine Land is mainly accounted for its inconvenient location because although the local residents of Palos Verdes love this attraction, it was not located in a hot spot for tourists or visitors and therefore did not attract enough business. Marine Land finally closed in 1987. All of the park's resident marine life was transported to SeaWorld in San Diego. The famed marine land killer whales Orky and Corky were also moved, upon which Corky was given the new, now famous, name Shamu. Even after marine land closed, many of the buildings remained where they were for the next 20 years. In 2007, development was initiated for a $450 million resort by owner Lowe Enterprises. In 2009, Terranea, a luxury resort, opened. The resort boasts 582 rooms situated on 102 acres of land. Additionally, an expansive nine-hole golf course is a prominent feature of Terranea and a large part of its claim to fame. Terranea is also known as a filming spot for a variety of television shows and movies, including ABC's popular show, The Bachelor. After 20 years since the park closed, Marine Land's history is still being preserved throughout the community through a variety of reunions and memorials. Terranea has made an effort to commemorate Marine Land's legacy by preserving their original trees planted there and by naming one of their event facilities the Marine Land Ballroom. Visitors wishing to remember Marine Land can go to Point Vicente Interpretive Center and enjoy the Marine Land display, including the statue of a dolphin that used to be the display at the park. The Point Vicente Interpretive Center, located a half mile north from the former Marine Land site, opened a large exhibit in July 2007 entitled Marine Land Remembered. The exhibit features an extensive collection of marine land artifacts, memorabilia, and souvenirs, as well as recordings and a movie. Even though marine land may be gone, it will always be remembered in the hearts and spirits of Palos Verdes residents. One of the most interesting and distinctive creatures in the tides is the sea anemone. Often called the flower of the sea, 
The sea anemone is well known for its plant-like appearance, as well as its many vibrant colors and patterns. But, due to its unique anatomy, the sea anemone lacks a locomotive ability. They are found latched on to the sides or undersides of the rocks in the water, or burrowed into the mud in the sand. The only way an anemone can change its location is by catching a ride on a larger animal, usually a crab, or simply detaching itself from the rock and dragging itself to a new location using the foot at the base of its body called a pedal disc. This foot is the main muscle keeping them firmly grasped to the surface of the rocks as the tides roll in and out. Just as the other inhabitants of the tide pools, the sea anemone has its very own specific means of defense and survival within the tides. In low tide, when the water recedes back into the ocean, the sea anemone is faced with dramatic change in temperatures. In order to cope with the scorching heat, open air, and constant winds, the sea anemones close up when the tide goes out. In addition, they live in colonies and coat their bodies with sand and pieces of shells to protect themselves from the elements and conserve moisture. Anemones attached to the rocks during low tide reside in crevices where they stay cool and moist. Anemones out of the water generally retract their tentacles into their bodies where they may appear to be no more than wet, squishy blobs. Other than nature's elements, sea anemones face even more predators with the low tide. Seagulls take advantage of the anemone's open position, making it easy for them to pluck them off the rocks. However, possibly the most dangerous threat is the ignorance of humans. Unaware, some may step on them during the low tide. During high tide, the tide pool environment changes entirely. Once the anemones are completely submerged in water, they remove their tentacles from within their bodies, making them look very similar to flowers. It is here that the anemone's defense becomes its most useful ability. When faced with a predator or threat, the sea anemone's defense is the same as when it gets its food. Located within the tentacles are elements that sting, called nematocysts. In each nematocyst, there is a toxic compound that is released within each sensory hair. When an organism touches the tentacle, the hair cell attaches itself onto the creature and injects a small amount of poison. This is what gives the anemone its characteristic stingy feeling. The poison contains neurotoxins, which, when injected into the prey, either sting or paralyze the victim. Using these tactics, the sea anemone co-inhabits the beautiful tide pools with the many other unique creatures and plants living there. Together, they form one of the most amazing communities here in our very own backyard. A tide pool is a pool of water remaining after the tide has retreated. Many forms of life live in and around the tide pools. The intertidal zone is the area between high and low tide. The water is rich with nutrients such as plankton, dead organisms, and algae, which are replenished by each incoming tide and used as food by many of the inhabitants. The high intertidal zone is exposed and covered twice a day by high and low tides. The low intertidal zone is exposed only once per day by the low tide and the subtidal zone remains submerged in water. Different animals and plants live in each zone. However, in some places, the zones overlap. Tide pool residents have a very challenging and difficult existence. They live in an area that is constantly changing. They need to survive the heavy pounding of the waves and the movement of the rocks and sand. When the tide goes out, they must be able to withstand long stretches with no water, the hot sun, wind, birds, and people. The inhabitants have different ways of keeping themselves from being swept away by the retreating tide. Barnacles glue themselves to the rocks head first and wave their feet in the water to capture food. Shells such as limpets make depressions in the rocks that give them protection. After grazing on algae when the tide is high, they return to the same rock and clamp on tight to brace themselves for low tide. The sea urchins also make depressions in rocks that they return to and clamp themselves onto for protection. Some shells secrete mucus, a glue-like substance, in order to conserve moisture and hold themselves onto rocks. Other shells drill holes in the rocks where they live and are protected. If you take an empty shell from the tide pools, you could be depriving a hermit crab of a home or a sea anemone of its shell cover. Please leave everything in the tide pools. Be careful of the green algae on the rocks as it can be extremely slippery and could easily cause you to fall. Watch for the incoming tide and beware of the ocean at all times. You do not want to get washed out to sea by an unexpected wave. If you would like to experience the tide pools yourself, check out either Abalone Cove or Cabrillo Marine Beach. <laughs>